Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Classics of Philosophy. I'm your host, Gabriel Turner, and as always, if you go on to enjoy the show and want to show your support, visit patron.podbean.com forward slash the Classics of Philosophy, or alternatively, visit our landing page at theclassicsofphilosophy.podbean.com. Thank you for tuning in, and I hope you enjoy the show. Book three of the Dianima opens the liberations of imagination and the rational faculty of the soul. In chapter one, Aristotle opens with the claim that there are no senses apart from the five. These five senses he's referring to are vision, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. He then goes forward, making the claim that we can sense all sensible things. His rationale for this is as follows. Of tangible things, touch is qualified to perceive all those things which are qualities of the tangible object, qua tangible. We, as humans, in fact possess a sense of touch, and as such, we perceive everything which is, or can be, apprehended by touch. Moving on to things which are perceived not through direct contact, but through media, Aristotle states that these media are perceptible by means of the elements, air and water. He says that if multiple objects were to be perceptible through one media, and the body has the appropriate sense organ, then they will perceive both objects. Additionally, if one object is perceived by multiple media, and the body has a sense organ that is receptive of either media, then the body will get the appropriate information corresponding to the object, regardless of which medium it acts through. Now, what can be said of these sense organs? Aristotle says that sense organs are composed of only two of these elements, air and water. To him, fire is not a medium, and earth can only be said to possibly be associated with sense in some way. The conclusion that we can draw from this is that there is no sense organ apart from water and air, and that all the senses are possessed by all such animals that are neither undeveloped nor maimed due to our receptibility of these two types of medium, and as such, no sense perception can be left off our list, either through a medium or as a medium. It is at this point that Aristotle moves on to the discussion of how we perceive common sensibles directly. He says that it is impossible that there should be a special sense organ for common sensibles, which we perceive incidentally by each sense. Rather, Aristotle says that we recognize common sensibles because we happen to have a sense for each of these qualities individually, meaning that each sense organ receives its proper perceptible individually, vision of color, hearing of sound, etc., which in turn, we recognize when these individual sensations occur together and integrate them into the common sensible object that we perceive. Furthermore, he says that if we had a sense organ particular to common sensibles, such as Cleon's son, then we would have no perception of them except to say that it is Cleon's son, meaning that we would have no inclination as to what color, loudness, softness, etc. that Cleon's son is, just that it is Cleon's son. Adding to this idea of recognizing when individual senses occur together, Aristotle says that we have more than one sense such that common sensibles escape our notice less. For we perceive other senses' proper objects incidentally by each sense, but it is better to have senses of which we can perceive them directly. These common sensibles of which we are discussing inhere in objects of more than one sense, and as such are something unique. Continuing into chapter 2, Aristotle resumes the discussion of sensible objects, common sensibles in particular, first talking of sensation generally. He opens the chapter stating that since we can perceive that we see and hear, it must be either by sight itself or by some other sense. If the latter, the process would go on ad infinitum, and as a result, Aristotle endorses the view that a sense must perceive itself. In this respect, perception by vision is seeing. It is in this regard that some sort of apperception is taking place, perception of perception. He goes on into discussion of sensation generally, saying that the activity of the sensible object and of the sensation is one and the same, though their essence is different. The activity of hearing, audition, and the activity of sound, sonance. Both sound and hearing in a state of activity reside in the potential hearing, since as we have discussed that a sense must perceive itself, 
perception of sound is hearing, and this must reside potentially in hearing. This is a result of movement taking place in what is being acted upon, the sense organ. But since the activity of the sensible and of the sensitive is the same, though their essence is different, it follows that hearing in the active sense must cease or continue simultaneously with sound, and so with flavor and taste and the rest. However, this is not the case with their potentialities. Early natural philosophers believed that black and white cannot exist without vision, and similarly with flavor and taste, but this only applies to actuality and not to potentiality. Hearing and sense are in one sense one and the same. After defining the relationship of sense organs and their proper objects, Aristotle asks us to consider how we apprehend the differences between two or more sensible objects of different senses. Each sense then relates to its sensible subject matter. It resides in the sense organ as such and discerns differences in the said subject matter. For example, vision discriminates between white and black, taste between bitter and sweet, and similarly in all other cases. But since we also distinguish white and sweet and compare all objects perceived with each other, by what sense do we perceive that they differ? This is again related to our discussion in chapter 1, in that we must somehow perceive the aspects of common sensibles and can recognize when they occur together. He says that it is by some unique sense that we do this, but as already discussed, it is not a sense organ that we perceive these things, for we already have the sense organ by means of which we can apprehend these qualities of sensible objects. As a result of this, Aristotle says that, incidentally, it becomes clear that flesh is not the ultimate sense organ. For if it were, judgment would depend on being in contact. Nor again is it possible to judge that sweet and white are different by separate senses. But both must be clearly presented to a single sense. It is by means of some unique faculty that we assert these differences. Aristotle says that if this unique faculty asserts, so it thinks and perceives. Once again, from this we can draw the conclusion that it is impossible to pass judgment on separate objects by separate faculties. He goes further with this, saying that they are not judged at separate times. The reasoning behind this being that both senses must occur simultaneously to pass judgment on them. For we say that we now say that there is a difference in this current moment. This judging sense must be in one sense undivided and judged without interval, and divided in another. It is indivisible spatially and numerically, but is divided in essence, as it can perceive things such as bitter and sweet at the same time which possess opposing movements. From here, we move on to chapter 3, discussing the relation between sensation and thinking. Aristotle states that there are two special characteristics which distinguish soul. These characteristics he is describing are movement in space and thinking, judging, or perceiving. He says that both practical and speculative thinking can be regarded as perceiving, for in both cases the soul judges and has cognizance of something which is. He goes on to refute the popular view of his predecessors that thinking just is perception, rather that it is implied by it, and more specifically, that both practical and speculative thinking are not the same as perceiving. Of practical thinking, he says that it is quite clear that perceiving and practical thinking are not the same, for all living creatures have a share in the former, but only a few in the latter. Nor again is speculative thinking, which involves being right or wrong. In this case, being right is analogous to true opinion and knowledge, and wrong their opposite. He says that perception of proper objects is always true, and yet it is possible to think falsely. He says that Imagination is different from both perception and thought. Imagination always implies perception and is in itself implied by judgment. This being said, imagination and judgment are different modes of thought. Aristotle says that imagination lies in our power to use whenever we wish, conjuring of images, whereas we cannot form opinions at will. Of imagination, we are like spectators looking at something dreadful or encouraging in a picture. From here, he breaks judgment up into three categories, knowledge, opinion, and prudence, 
along with their corresponding opposites. Once again, Aristotle finds it best to discuss these attributes of the rational faculty before discussing the whole, and so we must first talk of imagination and judgment. Imagination is one of those faculty or states of mind by which we judge, and are either right or wrong. The speculative faculty. It is in a sense movement, or phantasms, by which we are able to cognize images. Imagination can be thought of in two senses, one due to external stimuli, the other an internal cognizance, but due to previously external stimuli. For example, if we see a polar bear, we recognize one in thought through these phantasms created by external stimuli. The second kind of imagination also implies perception, but we can choose to conjure up the images at will. For example, if I were to tell you to picture a polar bear, one can at will conjure an image of a polar bear. Aristotle affirms this process of reliance upon stimuli by stating that imagination always implies perception and is itself implied by judgment. This being said, we must affirm that imagination and sensation are different. To do this, Aristotle says that sensation is either potential or actual. For example, either sight or seeing, but imagination occurs when neither of these are present, as when objects are seen in dreams. Similarly, he says that if imagination and sensation were identical in actuality, then imagination would be possible for all creatures. But this appears not to be the case. For instance, it is not true of the ant, the bee, or the grub. He also reiterates this idea in the distinction of imagination and judgment. The former is to be used whenever we choose, the latter not within our power. Aristotle says that of judgment, we are immediately affected by our opinion, but not so in the case of imagination. This mode of thought, judgment, implies opinion and requires reasoning power, i.e. practical thinking, which although some creatures have imagination, they have no reasoning power. Thought is held to comprise imagination and judgment. He further defines this idea of imagination by stating that imagination is a process by which we say that an image is presented to us. It is one of those faculties or states of mind by which we judge and are either right or wrong, as in sensation, opinion, knowledge, and intelligence. Aristotle says that we might imagine using both perception and an opinion of the object being what it is. For example, we imagine white using stimuli and the opinion that it is white. However, Aristotle says that this mode of thought, imagination, is often false, but true opinion can only become false when the facts changes unnoticed. And so, if we reject the true opinion of something in favor of a false appearance, it must be at once true and false. Imagination, then, is not one of these things, nor a compound of them. From here, he adjusts his scope of view and returns to this idea of imagination being some movement. If, then, imagination involves nothing else than we have stated, and is as we have described it, then imagination must be a movement produced by sensation actively operating. His reasoning being that it seems to be perception of proper objects, their attributes, and the attributes of common sensibles. In other words, it is a transition from the sensible object via a medium to the common sensorium where practical thinking occurs. Some perception occurs transmitted to the practical thinking faculty by movement or phantasms, where judgment can occur. Perception cannot go beyond de re perception, the proper perceptibles of each object, whereas any propositional content requires either imagination or judgment, de dicto cognitive contents. It is in this cognitive state that judgment takes place via perception and imagination. In chapter 4, Aristotle discusses the part of the soul that knows and thinks, the practical thinking faculty. Aristotle asks us to consider what his distinguishing characteristic is and how thinking comes about. He says that this process of thinking can be thought of being acted upon by what is thinkable, similar to the act of perception and the perceptible objects. He proposes that this part then must be receptive of the form of an object, i.e., must be potentially the same as its object, although not identical with it. As the sensitive is to the sensible, so must the mind be to the thinkable. This concept of that which is being acted upon being potentially 
that which the object is actually alludes to the concept that we were first exposed to during the discussion of sensation. He goes on saying that mind, since it thinks all things, should be uncontaminated. The reasoning being that if any foreign thing were to enter it, the process would be hindered in some way. From this, he asserts that the mind has no characteristics other than a capacity to receive, and thus has no actual existence until it thinks. It is according to this statement, which I just read, that Aristotle states that it is unreasonable to suppose that it, the rational soul, is mixed with the body. For if it had actual existence, it would be qualitative, and if it was qualitative, then it would have some sense organ. But it in fact has none, as it has no actual existence until it thinks, nor does it have any material constituents. He goes on saying that it has been well said that the soul is the place of forms, except that this does not apply to the soul as a whole, but only in its thinking capacity. This statement seemed not to be referring to forms in generalized sense, since as we have said, perception is a taking on of the form of sensible objects, but he's distinguishing perceptible forms from intelligible forms. These intelligible forms exist in this faculty of the soul, although he does not explicitly define how these intelligible forms come to be or interact with the mind, and they occupy it not actually, but potentially. He further asserts this difference between the rational faculty of the soul and the sensitive faculty through discussion of excessive exposure to stimuli. As we discussed last episode, exposure to too much stimuli of any sense results in destruction or lessening of the sense organ, as in the case of exposure to too much light. However, Aristotle says that this is not the case in the rational faculty, but when mind thinks the highly intelligible, it is not less able to think of slighter things, but even more able. He then references back to the potentiality of the mind in two senses, as we have discussed. When the mind has become several groups of its objects, as a learned man when active is said to do, even then the mind is in a sense potential, though not quite in the same way as before it learned and discovered. Moving on, he says that things and their essence are different, as in the case of flesh, for flesh and the essence of flesh is different. The faculty or faculties by which we judge these things are either different faculties or by the same faculty in different relations. For flesh cannot exist without its matter, but like snub-nosed implies a definite form in a definite matter, it is through the sensitive faculty that we judge the quality of these things, but it is through a different sense that we judge the essence of flesh. Similarly with common sensibles. Therefore, we judge it by another faculty or by the same faculty in a different relation. Now one may ask, how does the mind think if thinking is a form of being acted upon and if the mind is not liable to be acted upon and has nothing in common with anything else? For it is when two things have something in common that we regard one as acting and the other as acted upon. In addition to this problem, Aristotle raises the question of whether the mind itself can be an object of thought. For either mind will be present in all other objects or else it will contain some common element which makes it an object of thought like other things. He also offers an additional route, saying that there's possibly another explanation, that mind is potentially identical with the objects of thought, but is actually nothing until it thinks. This is being acted upon in light of some common element. What the mind thinks must be in it in the same sense as letters are on a tablet which bears no actual writing. This is just what happens in the case of the mind. He then says that the mind itself is thinkable, just like other objects of thought. Speculative knowledge is the same as its object. This is concerning those things which do not have matter, i.e. the forms. Things that have matter, on the other hand, each of the objects of thought is only potentially present. Hence, while material objects will not have mind in them, mind will still have the capacity of being thought. It is at this point that we close chapter 4 leaving us with questions as to how the rational faculty of the soul employs the form of its objects and in what fashion the mind thinks. Do we think all the time or intermittently? How does the soul use the forms? We'll find out on the next episode of the Classics of Philosophy. I want to thank you all for taking time to listen to the podcast. And as always, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me using the email, theclassicsofphilosophy at gmail.com, which can also be found on my homepage at theclassicsofphilosophy.podbean.com.
Once again, thank you all for listening and joining my journey inquiring about life, customs, and things good and evil. I'll catch you on the next one.